Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of the Soccer 60 podcast brought to you by Little League. Um, if you're wondering what is Soccer 60, well, we're going to talk about all things you football. Um, the stage where it creates champions and also ultimately legends. Every week, we will be bringing in a coach to tell you guys more about themselves and we'll sit down and dissect more about some questions about the industry. Uh, and also towards the end of the show, we will be answering some of your questions. So don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms, which is Little League Soccer MY on Instagram and on Facebook, Little League Soccer Malaysia. Uh, in this podcast, you'll be uh, joined by myself, Henry, Chu, um, Andy Johnston. And for the very first week, the general manager of Little League Soccer and the under nines coach, Shazwan Wong. What's up, guys? Hi, What's up? hi everyone. All right, Henry. How, how is everyone doing? Good, not, not too, too bad. bad. I, I think we should start this morning by talking about uh, yesterday, Henry. Uh, let's not talk about yesterday. <laughs> please, <laughs> please explain to everybody uh, right. what happened yesterday. All right, so uh, we had our very first pilot episode yesterday. Everything went very well. Uh, unfortunately, we have to re-record because um, I think I messed up with some things. I, I, I got a bit too ambitious with uh, our OBS stream. And uh, that's why we're here again to re-record. But don't worry, uh, whatever we've spoken about, we'll only, remember, we'll only talk about the main points, but the questions and the surprising parts will stay a surprise. All right. Um, to start things off, Andy, let's talk a bit more about why we're starting this podcast and also about Little League and Soccer 60. Yeah, so I thought I'd start off talking about um, what Little League Soccer is. There'll be a lot of people listening to this that uh, have no idea who we are and what we do. So just to give a very quick overview, um, the business comprises of three parts. First part is uh, Little League at Schools, where we go into school sessions, we coach their after school activities and, and basically help the teachers. <clears throat> the second part is our development sessions, which we run on a Saturday and Sunday morning. These are open to the general public to come and join. We accept kids from three years old all the way through to 18. Um, it's an introduction to football where the, the primary focus is for kids to have fun and in, enjoy their Saturday and Sunday morning. And then finally, our, our more advanced level is a program we call FC Kuala Lumpur. Um, this takes kids from under seven all the way through to under 18. Um, they train midweek and then play matches in the AirAsia Junior League at the weekend. So that's a little overview of, of what the, the company and the club is about. I realized when we recorded yesterday's episode that we hadn't really touched upon that very much. So we, some people may find it confusing hearing Little League at times and FCKL at other times. Um, these two are interlinked. It just deals with different, um, different levels of, of kids' development. Mm. So that's what the club's about. Why we decided to start doing this podcast. Um, I think coaching is an interesting topic. Everybody that comes to be a coach has an interesting story and a unique journey into how they ended up in that position. And for the most part, children turn up to their coaching sessions, they get delivered a coaching session by whoever their coach is, and then they go home and they never get to know the coach very well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of their interactions is purely speaking about football and football philosophies. And I think it's quite interesting to get to know your coach a little bit better, get to know their mindset and try to um, understand what message they are trying to deliver and for what reason so that's the main purpose of the the podcast um i think that we can achieve some interesting outcomes from from letting people have this kind of insight mm. i think like i just touched upon it's going to give uh, kids a little bit a little bit of a different look at their coach and who they are and what they are trying to achieve i hope as well that it will also inspire some some young coaches who are coming up and and just learning their trade and to listen to coaches that have been experienced and coached in several different organizations, perhaps several different countries. Uh, I think that's an interesting lesson for, for somebody to listen to if you are a young and aspiring coach. Yep, that sounds great. And also, this is an opportunity to see the lighter side of your coaches as well for whoever is following. I forgot to point out to Shazwan yesterday before we started the, uh, the, the uh, podcast there's two rules for this podcast, Shaz. Number one, no swearing. And number two, don't be. <laughs> number two, don't be boring. Those are, the two, those are the two rules I'm instilling on every guest that comes in. So we, man we managed to get through yesterday's session without any swearing, so that was good. That was uh, great. Yeah, I'm not went, sure about today. We went hopefully we went through without being boring as well. So uh, let's see how we go for the rest of the show. All right, um, Shaz, one, we're going to move on swiftly 
to our very first segment, which is Explain That Kid. Just a very short explanation on what you're wearing. It seems to me that it's an orange Adidas shirt with SW, but there is also a very old Little League crest. What's that? Yeah, What's that? Uh, this is the jersey uh, coaching kit that we wore back in 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So this kit is 10 years old and pretty glad I still can fit on it. <laughs> Uh, what were you, how I, I saw some old pictures uh, of you when you were sharing them and my gosh um, I, I don't know what to say I was well built at the time <laughs> 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 I aspired to be that uh, in that body frame then uh, but um, anyways uh, Andy also has the new Little League uh, shirt on so we have a three generation or like three four generation thing going on I've got my uh, 2019 coaches kit on uh, even I, never before we go any further, yep. I, yes, I want to bring up that point so that there's no confusion here. Henry is somehow wearing a Little League coach's top, but he is by no means the coach. Nope. He is our marketing guru. Um, I do, I do never... assist in coaching sometimes, but... Uh, so you're claiming yourself as a coach now? Nah, I don't have the credentials. That's why we've got you on. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, that was a good way to start things off at a light note. Uh, let's get into coach Shazwan. So Shazwan, why don't you give us a little bit uh, background of yourself uh, to the listeners and how you got yourself into football and eventually into coaching? Okay, so uh, I was born in Kampa, Perak and eventually grew up in Ipoh. Mm. Uh, started playing since the age of 10, 11 years old. Uh, my dad plays as well. Uh, so that got me in... Uh, so where I start, I used to play at the park and then eventually played for the school. Uh, and then I moved to a higher level. I played for PKNP. So I was scouted one by them in one of the football camps that they, they run regularly in Ipoh. So I played there for a couple of years and then I continued playing in the Ipoh League. Uh, and then eventually when I moved to Shanghai, the first thing I looked for is also a football club down there. Mm. So I ended up playing for Shanghai Lions in the Sunday League down there. So basically, it's all, all about football. All right. Uh, before we move on into how you got yourself into coaching, we also have a little bit of a small information to the listeners, which is that Shazwan, you were also part of or went on trials um, with the Malaysian under seven, under nineteen team for the nineteen ninety seven World Youth Cup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I went on for trials. Uh, managed to get past the first stage. Uh, but didn't get past the second stage. I think it's tough. And during that time, there's a lot of big names down there. Eventually, they become uh, big stars. I think like there's a few players in there like Khalid Jamlus, uh, Wee Sarawanan, and then my good friend Chan Wing Hong is still there. I played with him since the days uh, we played for the district in under 12. Wow. So wow. I think these guys like move on to become like legends for Perak. Ah. What, what, what process led to you being selected for those trials, Shaz? Uh, the first trial was an open one, actually. Uh, everyone can come. Uh, during that time, I was playing for PKNP under 18. Uh, so I was 16 at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so we won for first stage of the trial. Actually, there are coaches from FAM did turn up. I think they're doing a nationwide mm. uh, trials to look for players to prep for the 1997 under 19 World Cup. So I got past the first stage, like loads of people down there. I think uh, from Para, move on to the second stage, there's about like 30 or 40 players. And then on the second stage, I think they only picked two or three from there to go on for the next stage, which is going to be held in FAM, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we, we, talk, we touched a bit on that, but now we want to talk just about... To, just to summarize, yeah. he, f he failed in that trial. Yeah, I mean, like if I've gone through, I would have played against Aima, Rikome. I think oh, uh, yeah. Henri yeah. was here, uh, Trezeguet was here at the time. There's like a fair bit of like world big names down here. Yeah, I remember I was uh, 2001, I was 8. Uh, and I, I, I was very, very uh, excited to know that we were going to host the World Youth Cup. Um, obviously, um, the, the people that came, the, the teams that came down were so good. Um, uh, but I was like a very patriotic kid and I was like, oh, Malaysia's not doing well. Uh, I was very sad about it, but you know, we have seen better days, we've seen worse, worse days as a fan. Uh, but yeah, anyways, we've talked about the coaching, uh, the, the playing aspect. Uh, Shazwan, how did you get into coaching? 
Uh, basically, I got into coaching uh, by chance. Actually, mm-hmm. uh, I was playing for this team, Shanghai Lions, where uh, predominantly are uh, school teachers. So one day they invited me over to coach for one of their Saturday Sunday program. So I turn up. And I got chucked into babysitting a bunch of four and five years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's my first coaching experience. With no, but, no, with no guidance whatsoever. Uh, basically, they tell you like manage these boys. They play in the same area. I think I spend most of my time picking the balls outside of the grid and put it back on f- just to keep the game going. <laughs> but eventually, I got caught on the coaching bug. I think I enjoy it, and then slowly progress into a higher level of coaching in Shanghai. Mm. Du- double-ended question here, Shaz. Number one. What was your thoughts going through your mind when you first entered that coaching session with four-year-old What year old have kids? I got myself into? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> and the second part of my question was, there must have been something in that first training session which piqued your interest to go back again. So what I was it I then? enjoy it. Uh, I think the kids enjoy it because basically I'm not running any exercises. It's just like having them playing a small-sided game 4v4. I think I enjoy it. Uh, I don't know why, don't know how, but it seems I enjoy it. I kept coming back. The pay is not great, to be honest with you. I didn't do it for the money for a start. It's just like, uh, I was not supposed to do anything in Shanghai at that time. But I grew to love coaching from then on. Okay. Did you, were your kids already born then? Uh, that is back in 2003. Not my boy. Not my right. boy. I think my daughter was just about one. Uh, not even. I don't think my daughter is even born yet at that time. Really? Wow. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Um. So, then we talk. We we talked about how you started coaching. Now we want to talk about how you got into little league. Uh, I first got to know little league from one of the tournaments held in KL. I mm-hmm. think it's back in either two thousand four, two thousand five. I think at first I came with a scratch team, so uh, the coaches down in Shanghai like, let's plan to go for a tournament in Malaysia. So we put up a team which is not training regularly. I think we have like two sessions before we travel to KL, oh. and after that we came in. I think I, I'm not sure if Andy was there the first. Are you there, Andy, on the first one? Yeah, yeah, I was there. Bec- um, I was always involved in it. Uh, just a little bit of background little league started in the year 2000 um i believe the first international tournament we put on was 2002 uh i wasn't involved with the organization of that but i was around as a coach um and then i think the first one you came to was in 2005 uh we held i think the the first one that i turned up was in alice smith I think it might yeah. be 2004 or 2005. Maybe 2004, 2005. And then the next yeah. year's one was in uh, Royal Salang. Or, uh, sorry, um, Bukit, uh, Bukit Kiara. I think we yeah. came to Bukit Kiara with our team that is picked, that has been selected and has been training regularly as well. Yeah. But hmm. I think that that always creates a connection. Like if you're ever running a, a tournament that you intend to be an international tournament and attract teams from overseas, uh, Shaz brought the first team from China that mm-hmm. ever that had ever been to our tournament. So that immediately is like, you want to know who these guys are. You want to know what they are are, are doing um, in China, how they heard about us, um, and then we obviously heard that they were running a tournament of their own. Uh, I think in two thousand and seven was the first year we went for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so we went back and reciprocated. They came to our tournament. We went to theirs. We did that a couple of times. And that's how Shaz and I got to know each other. Then my next question to Shaz is, what were the words, exact words, words said by Andy Johnson that made you go, yes, I will join Little League? I actually, I can't remember. Uh, one can, thing I, I, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Uh-huh. Anybody that knows Shaz, and anybody who doesn't know Shaz, this is a little bit of an insight. He is an Adidas freak. Right, collects all okay. things that Adidas. The fact that he sat there in an Adidas shirt now, I reckon that might be the reason why he signed for us back then. <laughs> that was one of our first shirts. He thought these guys are wearing Adidas. Uh, yes, they're the they're the club for me. <laughs> probably, probably. Is it true? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So basically, I think Andy got to know that I'm coming back uh, to KL. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think Andy did drop me a text as well on Facebook, if I'm not mistaken, and said like, "Yeah, I'm coming back" and stuff like that. And to my surprise, Andy came to the hotel on the second day on my arrival and picked me up. Mm-hmm. And we went to Bangsa. 
and then they just go through me about uh, starting a new thing for Little League and stuff like that. I, it's a new project at that time. It's called Monkera FC uh, to capture the older kids that that has been with Little League. Mm. So I said like, why not? So that's how we got on. So I said yes on the second day of arrival to KL. And the rest is history. Basically, what happened was I had heard that Shaz was coming back and we had had um, a couple of conversations and he was talking about starting his own uh, football academy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that to happen. So quickly nabbed him in, uh, (laughs) employed him, make sure that he doesn't become the competition. Um, So like he he said there, we, we... at, we're at the stage when Little League had kind of um, reached its, its kind of bubble and what we found was, was kids that were aged like 15, 16 years old didn't want to play for a club called Little League Soccer. Um, it's, like, it's always been a development kind of program. So what we felt was we needed a, a more competitive club element to try and keep um, people a bit more focused when they wanted to mm. take it more seriously. And that's where we came up with the idea of starting Monkey RFC for it to become like a proper football club, um, act a bit more professionally, so to speak, being that you train midweek and then play matches at the, at the weekends. That was the main goal. Um, and that is what has now trans- transformed into FCKL. Um, that was where it started. So that was mm. in 2009 that Shaz came back. Yeah. And also, like, I want to touch on like when I leave Shanghai, to come back to KL, like, I actually have no clue what I'm going to do besides oh. coaching. Uh, it, it's a tough decision to leave there, uh, to leave the coaching job there, uh, heading back to KL, which is my first time staying in KL. So, like, when literally offered me a job, like, I didn't think twice. Mm. So, you never actually stepped foot into KL up to after you left Shanghai? Yes, no, nope. I never properly lived in KL beforehand. It's always in Ipoh. And then mm. came to KL for a bit, like for a month before we leave to Shanghai. Mm, mm, mm. And then he went and lived in Bukit Jolotong, which is not KL. And <laughs> you, also, you also have to consider what Bukit Jolotong was like in 2009, right? <laughs> it is not exactly Bukit Jolotong, it's much more inside of Bukit Jolotong. I, I know you've tried to explain that to me a few <laughs> times, but I just tell everyone Bukit Jolotong is where you live. Um, so now that but 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 on it sorry on a serious note Mm -hmm. uh you were really it was a a long way out from where we were training and it was a considerable journey for you to get to get to coaching i Um, think like like, uh during that time to make it even worse i only have one car yeah and i remember my experience when my first session down at uh what's elc in sungai bulo that's my very first session for little league uh, I have to look at the map, see how I get there, and then to drive there mm. without ways at the time, like I need to remember which turn to take at which part of the road and stuff like that. Mm. So it was a, quite a struggle. All right. Uh, we, know, we delve more into that. Um, what would you say was your most memorable moment in your coaching career with Little League? Most memorable moment to mm. see, actually to see the club grow as big as it is now. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone knows, like we have our blips back in 2010, 2011, I think, uh, during that time where we got yeah, removed yeah. out from our training center. So from about 300 kids, uh, we've gone down to about 15 kids. Wow. Uh, okay. That's a big dip. I think like we struggle for a bit. Uh, I stay on. I think like me and Andy, I mean like, to be honest with you, at that time, Andy could make an easy decision to like just shut down the company and move on. Mm. But we never did that. Uh, we fought on, we rebuilt, and now it is what it is now. During that time, um, there was, it was a regular occurrence for us to turn up for a training session with more coaches than we had kids. Okay, okay. That, that, that happened for, I, I would say, Close to Maybe, a year, I reckon. Yeah, I was going to say six months um, yeah. before we, we found a better a better location for ourselves and somewhere that we could base ourselves out of for an extended period of time. Mm. Uh, and then we started to slowly build it up. But anybody that's run a football academy will tell you when you lose the vast majority of your kids, it's the hardest thing to come back from because yep. you kind of lose 
uh, all the kind of reputation that you've built up over that period of time. Um, so to, to, to be at that, that the highest level and then drop right down to where you only have a handful of kids to recover from that is a, takes a long, long time. Yeah, right? I can a imagine. long process. And, and, and we lost, we lost those, uh, those number of kids overnight um, in 2011, I think it was. And it's taken us, I would say, the best part, well, the best part of a decade to recover from that. Uh, and that's yeah. not a journey for everybody. And, yeah. uh, you know, Shaz was there as, as one of, um, I think we probably had about six or seven coaches at that time. Yeah. And he's, he's the only one that's still here. Everybody else has gone off to do something else. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that I, I say that um, we are going to be, we, we are facing, I don't think facing is the right word, but we are currently in the same situation where we are stuck. Uh, at home and there's no options to kind of go out to play football which is a problem for us but I think hearing that story uh, there will be a light in the end of the tunnel and um, hopefully better days ahead anyways uh, we'll move on uh, from that story into the next segment which is to probe a bit more about Shaz Wan's coaching style uh, Shaz give us a bit of a background of how you coach how I coach yep. Yep. on the pitch very straight Mm-hmm. Uh, I know what I want. Uh, I demand the best from the kids, uh, even though they are young. But mm-hmm. I still demand. I want to instill that sort of mentality in them, where when they go out and play, giving up is not an option. So that's me. Uh, so far, so good. I think the kids been uh, able to adapt to it. All Obviously, right. Shaz, like I've known you now for for fifteen years, uh, I guess. Um, I know that you don't uh, take failure very well or, yes. or people not living up to your expectations. Obviously, mm. as uh, being in the coaching business, that happens all the time, right? Kids will, yeah. will always make mistakes, which is a natural part of learning. Um, a lot, some of them will, will maybe not listen to you as closely as you want. How do you deal with that in a coaching in, environment, um, being someone that takes that uh, quite hard a lot of the time? I uh, need to find ways actually for for the boys to understand what I need and I think I need to balance it out as well uh, especially like if I'm constantly straight on and off the pitch I think I won't have that relationship that close relationship with the boys mm. end of the day regardless the boys I want the boys to play for the club and also play for me so I think I managed to get that balance and get the respect and Patience. I think that's a lot of patience in getting uh, my message across to the boys. Like continuously, uh, session. I, I look at the session. Like see if it's work or not. If it doesn't work, I'll tweak it until the boys understand what I want. You touched on it a little bit there. Um, a lot of people will think that the relationship between the coach and players is just what happens on the training pitch and what happens during the match days and stuff. How important do you think it is to have a more personal relationship with your group of players? Today? I think it's very important. I think kids will be more receptive to your training if they're close to you. I think like after the session, if you're able to joke around and speak to the boys, it's like even now until uh, when we're doing the Zoom session, the first 10 minutes, just like to... Have a quick chat with the boys, like a light moment with the boys. I think that's very important and the kids will grow to respect you. Even though like even though like in training when you are strict, they don't go on and hate you. They respect you and it's easier for them to understand what I want, to grasp what I want. Mm. Okay. Um, do you have any coaching principles that you follow by Shaz? Uh, I want the boys to... Play hard, robust, not dirty. Uh, if we attack, we always try to play the ball forward very quickly. It's not like clearing the ball, but if we can play it forward quickly to launch a counter attack, that's what we are. So you're very attacking minded. Or would you consider yourself attacking minded coach? Yes, yes. I uh, remember when we played against uh, last year in the final against the Vietnamese team in the Vietnam International Cup. Mm. Those boys are massive. These are huge uh, compared, at the time it's the under eight tournament and those boys are huge. They look like 10 years old, hmm. but we didn't go out there and I know they're unbeaten in the run up to the final as well. So basically it's a very even match down there, but we did lack of size in there comparing to them. 
uh, we didn't sit back. Uh, we attacked them. Even though we conceded the first goal, we keep on going, keep on going, and eventually we won the tournament. Mm. Okay. Um, is there any football coaches right now uh, that you look up to? Uh, uh, has to be Andy, one of my favourite teams. <laughs> We'll, we'll wait for that until Andy Johnston come back out to train in the elite, Aha. to coach in the elite. <laughs> that will be the time. I think like uh, there's a few coaches that I look up to. Like I like the arrogance of Mourinho. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the tactical uh, part of Guardiola. And then I also like when I touch on the close relationship with, play, uh, with the players, I think clock man management is uh, one of the best. Mm, mm. Um. Last one before we move on to the next segment. Uh, how different would you say f- the football landscape has changed uh, in the start of your coaching career and now? I think it's very different. Uh, I think last time we don't have such a structure that we have right now. Mm-hmm. Basically, k- kids will sign up and come to train and then we'll just set them in teams and play. I think looking at now, uh, we have more clubs as well more players to choose from and like if you know Little League and FCKL we have put on a structure where there's a Little League program on the weekends where the best yep. player move on to the elite development program and then eventually move on to the uh, elite program of uh, FCKL yeah uh, I, 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 I like that point because like uh, what I realised uh, back then as well was that this doesn't apply only I, I'm talking about in the local aspect uh, this doesn't apply only to football uh, in terms of how significant the change has been to the local sports landscape. It, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of an example of when I was younger. I was um, trained to... Be, uh, I was in a badminton academy, uh, so I was training. And the way that they selected kids to play for competitions or to bring them up into a different level is very, very different. Um, I remember I was there for two years uh, and they had five stages. So you've got your rookie where you learn the basics, then your, your intermediate entry level and then into your professionals, which is where you play competitions, right? Um, and the way they choose you is very much to the coach. And um, I, I found that very interesting because... Is it either the coach like you or don't like you? Yes, yes, very much. So I, I, think, I think I never really uh, hit it off with the coaches. I was a very hard worker. I think um, I trained very hard. Uh, but I only managed to go up two levels uh, into my badminton uh, stage. So I've never really represented the academy competitively. Uh, but the way that they chose was just literally like when we line up to, see, to say good afternoon to the coaches, he points at you and goes, you, move to the next line. And that, was, that struck me because of how you talk about structure. And I realise now with the approach to the grassroots, this has changed significantly. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot more teams right now as well compared mm. to 10 years ago. Mm. I, think like for, l- I, think, I think for me, um, what's changed is the attitude of the people that are running these clubs. Um, back I- in those days where we were talking about Shaz just getting involved in 2009, 2010, uh, I can speak for Little League, it was run primarily as a business. Um, mm. And what I mean by that was it was bringing as many kids in, train them, collect their money and then everyone goes about their business uh, these days with the with the advancement of the structured leagues that are available to to kids um, clubs can't be run like that anymore you have to put into place a, a club which is training for a purpose you know there's a, a match at the end of the week you're training for that match and that has to be um, how clubs are run now it, you can't get away with just uh, bring as many kids as you can, collect money for training, and then hope everybody um, gets on with their lives uh, mm. in, in their other aspects. I think even with the Little League development programs we run now, it's very important that ev- at the end of every month, we put on um, a weekend friendly series where all of our uh, training centers come together and play matches against each other. That's a crucial part of kids' development. If they're yeah. not playing matches, they're not going to get better. So I think that that landscape has changed for the better. There's more... Um, competitive uh, tournaments and leagues that are being set up and that Mm. allows but also forces academies like ours to change the way that you structure your your setup all right Um, let's move on to our next uh, segment right now uh, which is called the world news and where we we asked uh, Andy and Shazwan on the current world news stories and obviously 
It's not even the elephant in the room anymore. Uh, but it's obviously going to be about the COVID-19 pandemic that we are currently all suffering from. Or at least not suffering, but like we, all encounter, we are all encountering. Um, so because of this, for the last two months, we have had no live sports. And uh, at first it was all like, ah, okay, we can do this. But basically it does, realistically, it does make a huge impact. Um, you look at the Premier League. Uh, on Friday uh, last week at the state of recording, um, they actually came together and they still could not decide on the end date on when they're going to end the league. Would they still want to resume the league? Um, Germany has resumed training. The Bundesliga has resumed training for some of the clubs. Um, but realistically, we are looking at uh, leagues who continue to run going over schedule. And that, that is going to be detrimental to scheduling all across the board. You look at the Euros that's been pushed to 2021. You look at Olympics that's been pushed to 2021 as well. What do you guys think about that? I think uh, you can't end the league right now. I think that's too much financial implications on that. I think like they're dealing with the sponsors and stuff. Uh, I think the league needs to continue. They need to finish the league. Mm. And especially with teams like fighting off for uh, relegation and teams right. that is fighting in for promotion, that's a lot of money you're talking about down there. Mm. Yeah, I, I, like... I totally agree with Shaz. I think that it's it's ludicrous the discussions that are going on about um, cancelling seasons, making them null and void, or leaving the results as they currently stand and declaring that the end of the league. That's not the end of the league, right? It doesn't matter what what realm you're in, how far Liverpool, for example, are ahead of of Man City. It doesn't matter. They haven't won the league until they've played all of the games. Uh, I think yeah. it's ludicrous to discuss any other outcome, and. I, you know, the, the Scottish FA have, have just last week, they cancelled uh, the championship and every level below that, uh, the, the Premier League. Is it the Premier League in Scotland? Uh, Scottish Premier League, yes. Yeah, Scottish Premier League. Yeah. The, the Premier League has not decided what they're doing yet, but the Scottish FA now has the power to end the Premier League season as well. Um, and you have a situation now where I believe it was Partick Thistle that got relegated from the championship they were two points behind the team above them and they had a game in hand. So, yeah, so that's a bit ridiculous there. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Like, I don't yeah. understand how that is deemed acceptable. Um, for me, it, the leagues just have to be finished. And if that means it, it runs into what is scheduled for, next, for the start of next season, so be it. I, I see you just then push back the start of next season, catch up, uh, the game somehow or run next season through a little bit longer and just slowly catch up over time. I, I don't see with these leagues being as big as they are and how much money is involved in them, I, I don't see how you can just walk away from it in the middle of the yeah. season. I think it has to be finished. Yep. Um, obviously, this whole thing is very new to all the leagues uh, that are currently running right now. But just a little bit of a topic to touch on is that... Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the English FA actually schedules their uh, games on a four-year basis. So, they prep four seasons ahead. Um, and um, I think to cancel it right now, um, to me, feels like it's a real cop-out, if you, if, you, if you know what I mean. Uh, yes, obviously, um, right now, there are certain results uh, or, or the table situation just looks the way like, oh, you know what, we can end the season and just declare a winner. But same, same point goes to what about those players, of, uh, what about those teams who are fighting for promotion? What about those teams who are fighting for relegation? That's going to be a problem. Uh, and also, we look at the local landscape in Malaysia. The Malaysian League just started. Um, what's going to happen to them? Yeah, I if they the cancel the league, like, how, how these players going to be, be paid if you cancel mm -hmm. the league round? I mean, like, Malaysian re League runs till what, November? Yep. And if the league stops now, what are they going to do for the next six, seven months? Yeah. It is a difficult situation. And players are on a one-year contract basis, right? Yeah. And also, we're talking about, we are talking about the financial implications if they qualify for Champions League relegation and promotion and stuff like that. I think at the lower level, if the league is cancelled, I think some clubs will cease to exist. Mm. Yeah, you saw, you saw at the end of last year, Barry completely collapse financial, yeah. financial ruin. That was before any of this happened. 
So how many clubs are going to be affected, smaller clubs we're talking about, are going to be affected by this now, by not exactly. receiving any revenue for, for an extended period of time? The flip side argument to that is that some leagues, um, the clubs rely on the league's payment, which will come at the end of the season. So one argument from some of the smaller clubs is, hey, if you end the season now, at least the league can pay out to us what is, what is owed and that money will see us through to the start of the next season. So there is a flip argument to it. And I think that this highlights the biggest problem is that no one knows what to do in this situation. There's, yeah. no, there's no guidance. No one's done this before. No one's been in this situation before. No one knows this is the best way to do it. There's going to be implications on whatever is decided. And we won't know until two, three, four years down the line whether it was the best possible outcome. Because mm. nobody is an expert in this situation. Everybody's got yeah. a view and opinion on what will, what will transpire if you do X, what will transpire if you do Y. But everyone's guessworking. You know? yeah. it's, 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 there's, there's, no, there's no one that can definitively say this is the best way to do it. Yep. So. And I think you also come across the situation where everyone feels hard done by. If you come back to the to the local scene in Malaysia, the majority of teams rely on sponsorship to, to run their costs throughout the season of the league. Well, if you cancel the league, the sponsors are going to feel like they should have their money back because they haven't got the exposure that they were looking for. The, right. the teams are going to turn around and say, yeah, but it's not our fault we cancelled the league. Maybe the league should pay us. The league's going to be, it's not our fault. Yeah, and the, where yeah. does the, where does this the whole blame stop? game will go on. Yeah, yeah, and it's not, it's not even a blame game. Everyone's right. It's, yeah. it's no one's fault that this has happened, but yep. people are going to lose out as a result of it. And there's no good way around that. It's just a reality. I, I, I like how you, you talked about how, uh, you know, parties will lose out because I want to talk about which spot generally will get hit hard. And which ones do you think will thrive in this whole ecosystem? The one will thrive? Probably yeah. eSports, which is not a sport. <laughs> <laughs> That's a debate for another day, I think. That's a debate for another day. No, actually, I uh, think it's a very interesting point because um, I've been the harshest critic of eSports in the past. Mm. Always dismissed them exactly how Shaz did just then. Um, and firmly believed that, that people need to get out and play more real sports, so to speak. But I think that... Yeah when situations like this come up you realize how um things such as esports can be actually such a, a beneficial thing you know like yeah. last weekend you saw professional race car drivers uh racing in the e f1 f1 well, yeah whatever, whatever it's called, the moto right? gp right? did that as and, well and isn't it moto gp did that and as yeah. well. it's not just professional race drivers you had uh professional footballers that were playing in it i know Petr Cech played in it um and then all of a sudden, if you are somebody that is into these esports and you see these professionals from the real world sport coming in, you can start to compare yourself as to how would you measure up against them. Um, and I think that that's fascinating. And in a time when you can't go outside and play, play sport, to be able to have some, something like esports to fall back on, I, I think actually you're, you're seeing its, its true worth now. And as much as traditional sports people like Shaz and I would-, would I still prefer them, outdoors. <laughs> 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 I'm the same. I'm the same, and uh, and my wife won't let me have a, a a games console in the house, so I'm not one of these partaking in the esports. But um, it's still a valid part of society, and you realise that in times like this. We will move on to our next topic, which is the pressing topic, which is the topic of the episode. Uh, this is the part of the podcast where we discuss a pressing issue with our panelists, and today Andy and Shazam will be discussing more about the post COVID nineteen in Malaysia what is going to be the new normal of youth football new norm I think we are on it already doing the online sessions from uh, FCKL and Italy mm -hmm. I think that might be a new norm I think probably Andy would say might, we might be able to continue that uh, even though we can get back get back out on the pitch I think there's still people that doesn't want to come out yet probably right, right. Uh, I think that will be a market for it yeah, I think that the post-COVID-19 um, environment is going to look different for everybody. And obviously, being in a, in a business where we organize large groups of people to get together at the same time, it's something that's going to continue to affect us for, a, for an extended period. Um, mm. Before the MCO was put into place in Malaysia, we had already started our own 
kind of social distancing measures. We had spaced out training. So there was a, a 30 minute crossover period between the, the young ones and the older players. Um, we may look to have to separate the pitch into, into smaller areas or, or larger areas, uh, give people more space between each other to play. But at this time, we just don't know. Uh, we don't know what's what's going to be announced by the government as the next step. We don't know what's right. going to be accepted. Um, as Shaz says there, there's going to obviously be some people that are going to be more wary about coming out of the MCO period than others. That will affect the makeup of our team trainings. Um, but one thing that has been great for me has been to see how well everybody, both coaches and, and players, have taken to this online training. Um, it opens your eyes to what is possible. It's by no means a substitute for getting out onto the pitch and training as a team, but it still allows you to do good quality work at home, keep up your fitness levels, become creative, become imaginative. These are two skills that are required to play football, so it's good to work on those. Um, as for what the future holds, we'll just have to wait and see and, and adjust to it as best as we can. Yeah, I think this, this is very hard to call it the new norm for football because mm. end of the day, this is what we can do now, but it doesn't mean it's going to stay like this forever. Because end of the day, football is a contact sport. You still need to go out and play against each other and stuff. Like it's not individual yep, yep. sports. So yep, yep. I won't say it's a new norm. I, I would say like this is the best that we can do now during these tough times. But I think when everything is going back to normal, I think eventually the football will go back to normal. I, yeah. think that's the th I think that's the thing. I think certain um, industries are able to go back to a, a, a new normal and operate. Um, we, we spoke previously about how uh, some offices will split their, their teams into Group A and Group B. Group A goes into the office one week, Group B goes yep. into the office the other week. That can function for companies where that's possible quite well. You know, Don't tell no that to Henry, though. <laughs> <laughs> he might opt for that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, for, but for football, to, for it to get back to football, you require at least seven players versus seven players or nine players versus nine players or 11 players versus 11. There's no way to get around that. It's football. You know, we're not going to have a new form of football that pops up where it's just one versus one. That's not going to be the new normal for football. Yeah. Um, other sports, go back to uh, your previous question about um, which sports can thrive in this uh, thing. We mentioned eSports, but there's a couple of other sports as well. I, I've been watching the Darts World Championship recently, which is a sport where you play, it is one versus one, and what they've done is been able to, to make a home world tour. So all the professional darts players have set up their own um, playing environment in their house. They've had mm. it verified by the governing body, and then they live stream themselves playing darts. And if you've never watched darts before, it's something that once you start watching it, it becomes strangely addictive. Um, <laughs> and, and to watch a live stream is something that is very, I could see it happening and being very popular. And in the first week of doing this, uh, one of the darts players actually produced a nine dart finish, which is the equivalent of like scoring a hat trick in football. Um, and that created a buzz around the sport. And the more people that watch that, there's no other live sports going on that you can watch. You start watching that. Darts could find itself in a position where it comes out of this in a stronger um, position than it was going in. So yeah. you, you, you do have some sports that can, can thrive in this situation. Unfortunately for us, I, football is not one of them. There might be some different um, aspects of training and, and online training that we do as a result of this. But it's not going to replace football. Football is right. not going to change. Right. Um, so we talk about this uh, and I want to go back to the earlier topics where uh, we talked about rescheduling and playing uh, football again. And obviously uh, the EFL is looking to play behind closed doors. Uh, means that football will come back but they won't be able to play with the fans. Uh, let's put it into the grassroots context in youth football. Do you see it translating from there where we just send kids play football with their coaches and then go home? Do you see that uh, translating here into youth football? That could be one of the ways, I think. If, if, if that is the standard of procedure to allow us back on the pitch, mm. not a problem, I would say. End of the day, all this uh, youth football development is all about the kids. It's not about the parents. Right. Right. So I think like, that, it's important to, 
get the kids back out and play. If that's without the parents, parents stay out, uh, outside of the field. So be it. That has that has happened in Singapore. Um, mm. In the in the biggest youth league in Singapore, they've played games behind closed doors um, before this MCO period has come into effect. Um, so it, it is possible. It's one way to move forward. But it's going to depend a lot on what the government's um, guidelines are. I think everybody is uh, understandably going to be nervous coming out of this period. And if the, the guidelines from the government are that it's safe for a group of 20 kids to go and play a game of football as long as there's no supporters, yeah, then great, we'll, we'll follow those guidelines. But I think that could be some time off still before, before that's going to be either encouraged or allowed, whichever one comes first. Do you but, for the, but for the higher level, I think playing at empty stadiums is going to be very weird, isn't it? If, yeah. If, if, let's say if you're Barcelona or the Liverpool or the Man U's where you play week in, week out in full stadiums and suddenly yep. you're playing in a very empty stadium. I think, I think that's a big difference. I think it might affect your performance as well. I think it's very bizarre for the players, sure. I, I saw there's an innovation from one of the clubs in the Danish league where they are looking at erecting uh, enormous um, screens in their car park so that when the game is going, being played inside the stadium behind closed doors, people can drive into the car park in their cars and view the game on one of these live screens, like, a, like one of those old school drive-through cinemas. Um, and then you will listen to the commentary of the game through the radio, watch it on your TV. And then there was even talk about beaming the footage of the fans in the car park to large screens inside the stadium so wow. the players can get some kind of atmosphere i mean who knows whether yeah, it will work yeah but, i've been like for this, a fan point of view as well like being at the terrace watching the game comparing to watching it separately on your own is yeah, a big difference but you yeah. could you can also imagine that if you were in a car park with two thousand cars everybody's got their car windows down watching the screen goal score beeping your horns <laughs> blasting your radio you can see that creating some kind of atmosphere as well and you can see some trickle over into the stadium i think for that yeah. but this is this is what i find interesting about this kind of period because it's it's a bad time for everybody but it's also what drives innovation it's what drives creativity it's what brings these kind of interesting ideas to to life so It'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. Um, I, I think one thing I want to add on to that is that um, I see sports, I think a lot of fans see sport as a form of entertainment. Uh, and at, to a certain point, uh, athletes are there to entertain, right? And I think uh, with the lack of for. sports in here, uh, a lot of people have been lacking their entertainment. And right now with all these, all these alternative solutions, it's just bringing back the love of the sport again if not more um, so there's always a flip side to it I, uh, and I think we can always look at the brighter side to I think where people will start appreciating uh, sports even more yeah actually instead of I watching agree. it on the TV uh, on the live telecast I think people it will get people to go out to the stadiums more to watch games and stuff like that yeah there'll be, there'll be interesting times we don't know when this whole thing is actually going to be done with realistically because um, around the world things are still going the same way Malaysia is doing very well in it um, but we can't we, we, we have to be very precautious about take, cautious sorry cautious about what's going to happen post MCO so everything's up in the air we don't know what's going to happen uh, and that is the reality now so we can't really set a timeline to when we will be back on the field but I think the things that we're doing now which is like online training classes um, options of playing ghost games um Esports to a certain extent, I think it's the only way to go for this point. Uh, and I, th I think as well, like like Shaz just touched on it a little bit there. Mm. Um, one thing I'm hopeful and looking forward to seeing when we do get back out onto the pitch is uh, kids really enjoying being out onto the pitch. I hope there's going to be no turning <laughs> up, half-hearted, uh, a little bit lethargic that day. Uh, I hope every time they get to the pitch, they, they understand how lucky they are to be out on that pitch, training, doing something they enjoy, um, and they approach everything with a 100% a mindset, an A mindset, as we, as we call it at FCKL. Um, because nobody has lived through this kind of situation before. It's, it's very yeah. unprecedented. Um, and I hope that it will make them stop and readjust a little bit 
Um, and every time they get back out onto that pitch, like I said, they feel uh, they feel very grateful that they can be there and, and put 100% of their effort into it. And it might lead to better things for us. Yeah, uh, hopefully for hopefully everything will be good and hoping for brightest days ahead. Um, we will move on to the final segment of our podcast, which is called Ask Soccer 60, where we take your questions from um, for Shazwan and also Andy. Uh, that we have collected through the show uh, This week, uh, especially for the coaches We actually have them send in some questions for Andy and Shazwan Now, Andy and Shazwan has never heard of these questions before uh, Even though we did a recording yesterday I made sure that we had a bank just in case things like this happen <laughs> Oh, so, so you were be so, so you're preparing for it Yeah ah, I'm you, prepared I, you, I, But I, you imagined that you were going to mess it up Now, now let me correct. Let, let, let me let me let me defend myself on this. I don't think um, I prepared myself for a screw up like we had yesterday, but it's more of because I was a cup scout and I was taught to be prepared. So I always make sure that in terms in times of this, I have some different things prepared just in case something happens. True enough, something did happen today. You guys should be getting a different <laughs> set of questions. <laughs> now, first question is gonna be. From Chris Nathan This one is for Andy first You're originally from Middlesbrough Why did you support Spurs? Ha. Well uh, I don't consider myself originally to be from Middlesbrough My dad was okay. born in Middlesbrough um, right. My mum was born in Devon And then relocated to Surrey at a young age uh, I grew up in a small town called Chippenham Just outside Bath um, can, can, can you say that again? Chippenham Chippenham, yeah, that was the small okay. town that, that we grew up in. Um, okay. The closest uh, big big football club to us was Swindon Town. Um, oh. That's the closest. They were not bad when I was a kid. Um, a couple of times they were in the first division. Uh, we did go and watch them occasionally, but it's not a hugely supported club. Um, I had relatives in my family that supported... Spurs, and that was how I, I got into supporting Tottenham. My brother is very flippant. He was a Man United fan. He was a Middlesbrough fan. He was might a be a Liverpool fan, fan now. Hold on, am I working with a United <laughs> fan? He was all, he was all <laughs> sorts of stuff, uh, and I know he's listening to this call, so hopefully he's laughing. Um, <laughs> but he was he he was all sorts of stuff until he eventually decided to be a Middlesbrough fan. Um, I could have chosen to be a Middlesbrough fan and follow my dad, but I think I made the right choice to be a Spurs fan. Um, but I will just add one little caveat that um, now that I have a son of my own, um, I'm finding myself strangely being drawn back to Middlesbrough um, and wanting to bring him up as a Middlesbrough fan as well. Uh, I, I don't have an explanation for that. I've never, never, ever had any interest in supporting Middlesbrough before. But I think being so far away from, from where home is, I would like uh, I would like my son to have some kind of tie to whichever club that he supports. I think it's it's very easy to to get drawn into the Man Uniteds, the Man Cities, the Liverpools right. uh, growing up in Malaysia. And Damien does have some tie back to clubs in the UK. Um, so I would like him to, to grow an affiliation, strangely enough, to Middlesbrough. Huh. So who knows? You might find me at some Middlesbrough games in the future. Uh, are you sure? Are you sure it's not? It's not like how you want to do it, like how Shazwan does it with his son, where his son is a Spurs fan, he's a Liverpool fan, and they both have that rivalry going on at home. That's the big disappointing I because I brought him to Anfield, <laughs> sat at top end, soaking into the atmosphere in Anfield, a match day atmosphere down there, came back to KL and turned himself to a Spurs fan. <laughs> what what went wrong? I have no clue. What does that say about the cop end? It can't be that great, can it? Oh, come oh, on. It's, <laughs> no, it's no, awesome. No, no. Um, okay, next question. This is for uh, Shazwan. Also from Chris. Um, Shaz, have you ever been mistaken as a Japanese local? When and where and how did it happen? <laughs> a Japanese local? So I a lot of people say that you look like Hideyuki uh, Dakata? Uh, I have not been mistaken as a Japanese. Uh -huh. But many times... People have mistaken me for Cairo Fami Chekmat. <laughs> for the Malaysian <laughs> national team goalkeeper. I remember there's one incident in uh, Petronas where I'm paying for some stuff that I bought. 
And then uh, the cashier asked me like, "Are you a footballer?" I said, "No, I'm not." It's like, "Don't lie." I said, "Like, I'm not a footballer." No, you are the Malaysian national goalkeeper. I said, like, "I'm not. <laughs> I'm Shaz." <laughs> And uh, Shaz, just a rough guess at how much money you've made impersonating Cairo Fami over the years. <laughs> Can't tell about that. <laughs> uh, this one is from Mark Hughes, and the question is ac- for across the board. Um, what are the best and worst aspects to coaching a youth team and an adult team? I think this is a little bit directed towards Shaz one as well. And which is most rewarding? Uh, coaching is rewarding, regardless. If you win matches, you win tournaments and stuff like that. I think managing adults is very challenging, mm. uh, especially with my involvement in KB United a few years ago. Uh, to deal with these working adults that's not 100% paid professionals, yep. to get their commitments to come down for training is, is very difficult. Because yeah, I, when, you, I agree. When, when you register them for the league, they know like they are the first 20 players that needs to be called up. So mm. if 15 didn't turn up for training, end of the day, I need to call them up again uh, for the matches because I can't replace the players. Uh, so it's not as the youth. The youth, we got a lot to choose from. Uh, we can register new players throughout the season, not a problem. So I think that's the most challenging part in uh, dealing with adults as well. Mm. Andy? So I'll start with adults. Um, mm. I actually had a good exposure to coaching an adults team when I... When I first um, started coaching full time for Little League, <coughs> I was <coughs> sorry, I was uh, 21 years old when I first started coaching, and I actually got involved to coach uh, a local adult over 30s team, which was very interesting. Um, everybody, by definition, was at least nine years older than me, and I was the coach wow. of the team. That taught me some of the best coaching lessons that I've ever learned in my life. Um, because these guys all thought that they knew better than me because they were older but actually I was the only one that was a professional coach no no one else there had any coaching badges or coaching qualifications and what it taught me was to to stick by what you think is right as a coach Um, many times as a coach you will you will see something uh, you try to adjust it and someone will question you on it Mm. and that's fine Anybody is entitled to have their opinion, but you have to have a reason for that decision you made as a coach. Um, and I think that's, that's hugely important because if you don't have an understanding as to why you've made that, that choice or that judgment or whatever it may be, um, you can't back it up. You're susceptible to being undermined by the rest of your team. The yep. minute you make a decision, someone questions it and you go, this is the reason you have the respect of the whole team. And once you have the respect of the whole team, then coaching is easy. Then it's just about implementing what you believe are the right tactics. So for mm. me, dealing with adults is, is harder because it will, it will be more, you'll be questioned more, right? And you have right. to be able to back it up and people will see through any BS that you give them. Mm. Similar sort of thing on the kids' side. Now, kids, you also need to explain your reasoning to. That's very, very important. You never want to be a coach that just tells a kid to do something just because you said so. You want to be able to explain why. Dealing with kids, though, is easy. You know, you're uh, you're like a god to these kids, you know, especially younger kids. If you're the coach, they will listen to every word that comes out of your mouth. mouth. So that comes with that comes with huge responsibility. So you have to make sure you're teaching them the correct things. But it's not difficult to win the respect of a group of children. Right. You're automatically in a position of power. So you automatically have that respect. Hmm. hardest thing about dealing with kids is their parents <laughs> right because well, because you're airing it out here on the live podcast guys like but it's true yeah. it's true and yeah. i don't mean this in in any way to insult anybody or anything like that and uh, you know 99 times out of 100 parents have only good intentions but right. by undermining the coach if that's what what they do um you potentially cut all of that level of authority away from them in front of their kids. So how a parent Mm. speaks to a coach is crucially important. And we have always welcomed um, a dialogue between parents and coaches. That's really important to have that dialogue, but it has to be done in a respectful manner and it has Mm. to be done away from your, from the kids that you're coaching. You know, the, the kids need to see the coach on that pedestal and respect what they're saying. And then it's, 
it's our team of coaches and the parents job to make sure that what that coach is delivering is correct okay um uh last last question for for you guys and last this last that's yeah, double yeah. last there. because because i got cut <laughs> off for that moment over there uh, i want to end okay we end this on a positive note with this last question um oh shoot i kind of forgot the question now oh <laughs> <Henry>. <laughs> Ah, I, I thought I used you were going to ask my a question. I thought it. you were going to ask a question. Uh, okay, yes, that's, uh, I remember this question now. Um, you guys have your coaching licenses, uh, Andy and Shaz both. Give me one of the most, both of you guys, give me one of the most uh, memorable aspect or memorable quote that your coaching uh, supervisor or provider gave you guys when you were learning. Most wow. memorable. What, quote. what was it that you bring back to you from from this uh from your coaching, uh license course? You passed. What? You you passed. That was the favorite that's thing I I liked. That's that's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I no, think. No, uh, in all seriousness, for me, uh, I, I'll always remember this lesson. It was one of the first things that was um, uh, demonstrated to us by the first instructor on my first ever coaching course, and he partnered us up, and he made partner A, teach partner B how to tie your shoelaces. So partner B had to pretend like he had no idea how to tie his shoelaces and partner A had to give them all the instructions. And this was fascinating because tying your shoelaces is something that comes naturally to everybody, uh, except for my wife. My wife is terrible at tying her shoelaces. But <laughs> for most people, it comes very naturally to tie your shoelaces. So when an action becomes very natural to you, it's very difficult to break it down uh, into simple instructions for, for somebody that doesn't know how to do it. And if someone doesn't know how to do it, but it comes naturally to you, that process of breaking it down and describing it step by step is very difficult. And the point of that for coaches is that most people that get into coaching have played that sport to a certain level, whether it was a really high level or whether it was just a mediocre level, they have some understanding of the game. So if you're trying to teach something which comes very natural, just say, uh, for example, controlling a ball out of the air, if that comes very natural to you, it's very difficult to break it down into steps to somebody that doesn't know how to do it because you've never had to think about it before. Ball's in the air, control it on your foot, job done. Now you have to think, well, how am I actually doing that? And what am I doing to be successful at it? To pass that on, and this is what makes a good coach. Right. So if you are able to do that process and instruct somebody who has a harder time of achieving it than you do, then you're going to be a good coach. And this you know, goes from very simple things about like controlling the ball into more uh, technical aspects of uh, vision on the pitch and, and things right. like that. Right. Um, how you are able to communicate uh, those simple tasks to you to someone that finds it harder will determine whether you're going to be a good coach or not and that was one of the first lessons i was ever taught in my first ever coaching course and it stuck with me all these years and i, I tell that story to many people as uh, so i think it's fantastic uh Shazwan? uh memorable i'm not sure if i can remember any but the reason is probably i go on to these coaching courses when uh, i was in the business for quite some time so I think like I went into these courses with uh, with some experience, not like a new coach going into these uh, coaching courses and stuff where you get really, really excited and stuff like that. So, but one thing I can remember is when I did my C license, uh, the coach called me out and he, he basically tell the whole class like, uh, because he, he know for in advance that I was coaching already mm. and making quite a good income from coaching you football mm. basically he's making an example out of me like he's telling the class where after there's a few uh pros in there like after after your playing days actually if you do this properly you can make a living out in coaching mm. it doesn't necessarily you need to coach in the malaysian league or you need to coach adults there there are future in coaching you football so I think I think that's a good example. I th- I I know a few of them actually gone on and coaching youth football actually. Mm, okay. Uh, I think, well, uh, sorry, sorry, Henry. Yeah. Just one more point to finish on there. I'd I'd like to you know again I said at the start of this um, this show that we were hoping to aspire young coaches potentially yes. and and give them a pathway into that. 
too many people in my mind get caught up on doing coaching courses. Uh, yes, they're important. You want to work your way through the badges, but mm. coaching courses is not where you learn to coach. You learn to coach when you get into the field and you start delivering it to a group of players. Coaching courses will give you the basics of what you need to structure a session and the, the fundamental the guides, theories yeah. behind it. Yep. But you learn to coach by getting out into the community, coaching kids or adults, yep. whoever it is you're interested in, and also by finding other coaches who are more experienced than you, asking questions, asking yep. questions, learning from them. This is how you learn to coach. Those coaching licenses are there to, to aid you along the way and to serve as a, a marker uh, of the point of which you are qualified to. So other people yep. can see like you've got to this, this certain level and stuff. But I've seen a lot of, of highly qualified coaches on paper not be able to deliver an effective session. Uh, mm. And on the flip side, I've seen a lot of uh, low qualified coaches deliver fantastic sessions. You know, for me, it's, it's about experience more than these coaching badges. So if you're young and getting into coaching and you, you want to do that and seek that as a, as a career path, my advice is to find someone to coach and coach as many hours as you possibly can. Find a coach that's more experienced than you and learn off of them and then think about doing your badges. Don't start mm. with your badges. And then rule number one, forget about your weekends. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking truly from experience and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of our podcast, the very first episode. Thank you so much, uh, Chazwan, for joining us for today. Uh, no worries. Um, Stay tuned for next week where we speak to Paul Maysfield, the founder of Little League Soccer. And also, don't forget to give us your feedback. Uh, send us some questions uh, on our social media pages, which is Little League Soccer MY, and also on Instagram and also Facebook, Little League Soccer Malaysia. Um, until next time, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>